uh, militarily. And um, in places that Matt is looking at, in particular in Central Africa, sometimes poachers are indistinguishable from armed groups that use the resources in and around protected areas to fund their operations and sustain their operations. So it's not necessarily just about the big trophy poaching that we associate like with ivory and rhinos, but um, a lot of it is about timber and fisheries and low level of uh, bushmeat trafficking that sustain local political economies of, of conflict. And what we've been observing is that as park rangers have become more sophisticated in their law enforcement, they're, all, they're also kind of straying into combat territory. And they're also um, sometimes taking matters into their own hands and um, dispossessing the communities that live in and around these protected areas through, through violence and through which are tantamount to human rights violations. And there's been some attention paid to that this in a couple of exposés on the World Wildlife Fund. And there's a popular film on Netflix called Virunga which actually portrays this park rangers as these sort of noble heroes and defenders of wildlife. And so there's these two different competing narratives. One is the, the park rangers are the good guys and the poachers are the bad guys. And there's this other narrative that, well, as they're becoming more militarized, um, they're actually becoming bad guys as well. And so what Matt's done is he's engaged in this whole literature and um, he's actually categorized the different debates around militarization the sort of the, the pernicious effects, the, the, the potential positive effects. And so, so just so you know, I'll probably end up citing this master's thesis at some stage in my own work as someone that's organized the literature into categories. <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's what that's your contribution has been. So um, I will stop talking now and I'll go ahead and hand it over to Matt, but this is how it's gonna work. We'll give you, um, I don't know, let's say a maximum of 30 minutes. Does that sound good? Okay. And I'll give you a 10 minute and then a five minute and then a two minute, and then I'll um, kick you off completely if you go over. Okay. But, and then, um, then what happens is that um, we open the floor up for uh, guests that want to engage with you in, in your presentation. And then um, I think what happens is then we, we, we kick everyone out and then um, the committee plus Annette, we, we have a go at you and then we kick you out and then we talk about you and then we invite you back in and then um, say, congratulations. <laughs> Sorry, was I not supposed to say that in the first couple of minutes? Um, so that's that's how it's gonna work. So um, Matt, please take it away. Cool, okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, Dr. Day. Um, so before I start, just wanna say thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here and welcome to my thesis defense. Um, and also wanna say thanks to my whole committee of Dr. Day, Dr. Watson, Dr. Cropper and Dr. Scott for all their, their feedback and as well as their patience and encouragement along the way. Does that look good? Okay. So this is my presentation, which is titled Green Militarization, So What? Assessing Perspectives of What Can Be Done About the Militarization of Wildlife Conservation. So in the last year, several reports have come out that have presented grim outlooks for the, the state of biodiversity. One of the most important has been the IPBES report, um, which suggested that around 1 million species face extinction, many within decades, unless transformative actions are taken to address these um, drivers of biodiversity loss. So on the surface, these reports sound kind of like an all too familiar outlook and call to action to save these species before irreversible thresholds are reached. But they also come to matter because they, they shape how aggressively the global conservation community chooses and rationalizes to respond to biodiversity threats in policy and in practice. And so as, as poaching continues to be one of the greatest drivers of population decline among the world's charismatic megafauna like rhinos, um, elephants, and gorillas, the dominant global policy response has been to, to place a heavier emphasis on more and stricter forms of law enforcement within protected areas. Um, and within practice, this, this emphasis on law enforcement has really transformed anti-poaching and wildlife conservation to be more and more militarized, which has been termed green militarization. So what is green militarization? Um, it's now probably a very banal and familiar depiction of wildlife conservation um, in Africa, where rangers are standing guard to these, these last remaining rhinos and elephants. 
Um, but the term really refers to the use of military, paramilitary actors, um, techniques, technologies, and partnerships in pursuit of conservation. And it's kind of, it's, it's emerged out of this perception and reality in some cases that poaching has become this organized and transnational crime and it, and it poses a threat to a global security threat and that it can undermine the rule of law and governance in the country. And so these, these threats of, from highly organized poachers has really mobilized these kind of um, security and policy narratives that justify military involvement. And so South, Af South Africa's Kruger National Park really has stood out as this quintessential, quintessential example of green militarization. And it's really the main backdrop to explain this phenomena. Um, it's mainly because rhino poaching grew dramatically from 2008 to 2013. Um, and Kruger has shown that graph in the bottom right. And the state consequently took this hardline stance against poaching and they implemented all kinds of stringent anti-poaching measures and declared war on poaching. But as Dr. Day mentioned, this, is, this isn't really just unique to Kruger. It's, it's a similar pattern of a turn to military approaches have been seen in protected areas uh, within and beyond Africa. And it's really become this, this standard kind of approach in these types of protected areas. I know that's somewhat of a, a broad definition. So I wanted to unpack it just a little bit further. So this militarization can really refer to a number of things and the, the extent varies from country and protected area. Um, some kind of just describe it as this increasing reliance on advanced weaponry or surveillance technology like the, the drones or helicopter teams or um, infrared cameras to detect poachers that are crossing through park boundaries. Some kind of refer to it as this um, increased emphasis on the training of rangers and paramilitary tactics or counterinsurgency like tactics that are combat skills, endurance skills, um, or how to get intelligence from local communities. And it's also referring to these, these actors that are being brought into the conservation sector, which includes the, the national army or um, foreign and private militaries, and sometimes even conservation NGOs. And they're, they're either kind of taking on a supplemental role to, to aid anti-poaching units in some capacity or, or they're training rangers. And in some cases they do overhaul the anti-poaching operations like in Botswana. And so as you can imagine, this, is, this has been subject to some critical scholarship and ongoing debate over the impact of militarization. And it's begun to create this kind of strong tension between two sides where you have on the one hand, you have practitioners and those that are involved in the, the logistics of these militarized campaigns have defended it because it's, it's a stop the bleeding kind of approach to get this crisis under control. And it's the only way to stop or effectively handle the threat commercial poaching poses. Now, on the other hand, you have these critical social scientists and even some conservation practitioners who have just taken this hard stance against militarization and have criticized its effectiveness and its uh, some of the ethical implications of relying on this kind of approach. So I'm just going to briefly highlight some of these um, critiques. In terms of the efficacy, there have really been four main critiques. Um, one is there's not really empirical evidence to support that more rangers or these more foot patrols amount to better deterrence. Um, focusing exclusively on military training and anti-poaching can take away from some of these, the more kind of mundane conservation objectives that are equally important. It can risk losing the support of local communities and as it kind of excludes them from parks and consequently can make them antagonistic towards conservation efforts. It also does nothing to address the underlying drivers of poaching in the, in the first place. And then some of the other criticisms relate to how it's kind of this socially unjust model for conservation. These critics claim that it's like the militarization can alienate local communities and create them to be enemies of conservation when really they should be the people you're trying to bring in. Um, and it sends this message that animals are more important than people or it oversteps human rights and incites violence. Um, and some suggested that it reflects these historical continuities of colonialism where people were you know, violently evicted from parks or they were denied access to the resources in the park. And so these critiques have been extremely important to bring to light some of these, these issues associated with militarizing conservation. But up to this point, there's those that have criticized militarization really have failed to move beyond this critique and offer 
any alternatives how things can be done differently. And you know, moving beyond critiques and developing alternatives is so important because the implications of inaction or relying on a, a militarized kind of approach can have detrimental impacts to wildlife and people. Um, so my research question is kind of designed to push this debate along and ask what actions or alternatives can be taken to, to effectively mitigate the need to resort to these militarized kinds of responses. Um, or put more simply, what, what can or should be done about the militarization of, of conservation? And so what I'm really trying to illustrate with this thesis is that while there are these alternative ways of doing conservation that um, conservationists have proposed, but there's also shortcomings to these critiques that highlight multiple reasons why alternatives or broad calls for demilitarization may not um, produce desirable outcomes for wildlife or people. And so this presentation will continue as follows. Um, first, I'll go over the data collection methods and the analytical methodology utilized, um, which involve thematic coding of semi-structured interviews. Then I'll go over the findings from the interview data, um, a brief discussion of the interpretations of the findings is then provided with also with some recommendations for scholars and practitioners. And then I'll conclude with just some limitations of the study and the, the major takeaways. And so for my data collection, I conducted 19 semi-structured interviews over Zoom and Skype with both scholars and practitioners. And as can be seen in these two graphs in the top right, um, six practitioners were interviewed and 13 scholars were interviewed. The other graph just shows the geographical focus of each of the respondents. Um, so the scholars really included those that have been critically outspoken about green militarization or the ones that are these really academic thought leaders of the topic. And the practitioners range from an NGO, a donor agency, two large mammal ecologists, um, as well as two independent conservation consultants that have worked under multiple NGOs and governments. And this table at the bottom right show some of the questions used in the interviews. Um, so these interviews were very conversational, but these were really what the, these questions were really what each of the interviews pivoted around and were asked of all the respondents. So for my analysis, I utilized thematic analysis, which is basically um, just a way to analyze qualitative data where the researcher identifies um, common themes or patterns that repeatedly emerge from the data. So this involved first open coding of the transcribed interview text, uh, then axial coding to, to pick, compare and really find some relationships among those open codes. And then I refined them and developed them into broader themes that best um, captured the responses and perspectives of the respondents. And so based on the data from the semi-structured interviews, I inductively developed five overarching themes that really best reflected these different set of perspectives. And these are all displayed on, the, displayed on this slide. And I'm gonna go into each of them in a little more detail and provide some supporting quotes for each. So the first theme was placing people at the center of conservation. Um, and it was promoted amongst almost all the scholars. And so what this was really about is how, those, how these values that underpin conservation have to be um, more aligned to people instead of just being about species. It can't always be about species. Um, and so one of the two sub themes of this was that the rights or it was about the kind of like the rights of local people living adjacent to these protected areas. Several of these scholars felt that um, rights concerns have been displaced or rights have taken a, a back seat in international policy conventions ever since its militarization and law enforcement has ascended into as the point of emphasis. And so they were advocating for taking rights and rights-based conservation approaches more seriously by, uh, by integrating them back as the standard as to conservation and making it the starting point for any kind of conservation initiative. And really just ensuring that these NGOs or external actors see the people as rights holders and they have to be held accountable to them and to their relevant human rights frameworks that are in place for conservation. So the second sub theme of placing people at the center of conservation was a better commitment to community conservation and involving local people in conservation. Um, and community conservation really refers to like these um, grassroots level or bottom up kind of approaches where people living next to parks are given greater involvement in the management of parks or they derive more benefits from conservation. <laughs> 
And so they're, they're kind of promoting these both for the, the normative reasons, because it's, because it's the right thing to do, but also for these practical reasons, communities are like these, they're the first line of defense against poachers because they know who the poachers are and they know the wildlife and area too. So if you have them on your side, they're really powerful actors on the legal wildlife trade. So the second theme was reforming conservation law enforcement, which was um, kind of this position that law enforcement is really critical and a critical underpinning for good conservation, but there's ways to do it that don't resort to violence or coercion. And some first kind of drew parallels to the police reform discussions happening in the US and explained how good and effective law enforcement law really starts with community support and then it has to align with what the community wants and their interests. Others more in kind of the Virunga context were promoting striking a better balance in the training of rangers. They're not placing so much emphasis on combat skills, but they're also focusing on these nonviolent kind of strategies like community relations or just trust building with the people in the communities or just increasing more face time and presence in the community. And some also suggested that we have to be more cognizant of rangers and their and prioritize their needs instead of just militarizing them. And so next, others recommended um, prioritizing strategies beyond the front line and beyond these on the ground types of deterrence approaches. They felt that law enforcement has to coincide with other approaches and because poaching is complex and it's, it has to be addressed in a multi-pronged way that reflects that complexity. So within that, there were really four recommended ways of doing this. One was concentrating more on the demand side of the issue and creating these demand reduction campaigns that are nuanced and culturally sensitive. Um, second, some, some advocated for approaches to anti-poaching that kind of target upholding the rule of law or establishing good governance and working to dismantle those trafficking networks embedded in government systems. Because there's obviously some level of complicity in governments to, to make these, um, make it make wildlife trade lucrative and effective. So third, several scholars advocated for more work to tackle this, the funding side of the issue and really bring attention to the donor organizations and the, and the philanthropists of what their funding supports. And also just to encourage a better distribution of money between more approaches rather than just these heavy handed kind of strategies. And lastly, um, although it's not a simple policy recommendation, others discuss this need to focus more on the, the structural drivers of poaching and address those conditions that allow poaching to thrive in a place. So that would mean addressing poverty around parks or addressing human wildlife conflicts where animals are destroying homes and crops and just tackling structural violence where states kind of operate by using violence to resolve conflicts. So the fourth theme, um, it's not that easy to just demilitarize this refers to the, the mix of scholars and practitioners that were weary of promoting any kind of demilitarization project or campaign because it's, it's not always feasible or an ideal outcome in, some, in certain contexts. Some respondents explain that militarization is because wider society is also militarized, especially in these places that have ongoing conflict. And it's not just the conservation sector. Um, NGOs also, and they also, NGOs are also kind of limited by the, the will of their host government and what they want the NGO to do. So conservation will be more militarized when host governments are militarized themselves or they support a hardline response. And that really, that places a lot of limitations on what someone or an NGO can do. Um, some explain that rangers need arms and military equipment just for self-defense or to address human wildlife conflicts or to um, protect communities that are in remote areas or are being threatened by armed groups. And so as this, last, um, as this last quote explains in the bottom right, when you're promoting this demilitarization and you stop funding a green militarization kind of project, you can also risk har causing more harm than good because you're training people in combat skills and arming them and then you, then you make them jobless. And so the last theme the critiques of the critiques, um, instead of offering alternatives, an another mix of scholars and practitioners really took issue with the green militarization critique itself. Some pointed to the flaws in the content of the critique and how it's 
um, how it overgeneralizes the much more nuanced and diverse ways conservation is practiced all over conservation or all over Africa and the world for that matter. And how there's different kinds of protected areas and there's even places where rangers don't have guns. Um, similarly, some stated that this green militarization can over sensationalize the, the physical violence or kind of puts forth this misleading narrative because these, these spe spectacular cases of Virunga and Kruger that are often used to explain green militarization can't really represent the vast majority of cases where things might be working together a little bit better. And some thought that kind of like without alternatives, so what, this critique's not really useful without um, offering any practical advice or how to do conservation better. Now, on the other hand, other cited problems with this analytical approach and the underlying methods that these green militarization scholars utilize, and this is mostly, mostly the practitioners. Um, some said that the critiques and this kind of analysis is taking the, the wrong attitude or it, it has like this fatalistic ethos to it. It doesn't appreciate the reality of what a, what a practitioner is really trying to do in a conservation space. Right. Um, then there was also this kind of subtle and sometimes overt dismissal of social science where some respondents claim that the critique is anecdotal and not true science, or it's just an advocacy position, or it's not really scholarly at all. And so I think there's really four overarching significant discoveries that can be interpreted from this, these findings. One is, or the first is at least among the scholars, there's a, there's a clear consensus that there needs to be greater efforts to position these people as like fulcrums to good conservation. It's not it's not really a new argument, at least in conservation circles, but there's a need to kind of reintroduce those values and ensure they don't get lost with all this militarization happening. Um, second, I think this shows that these criticisms are not entirely a castigation of law enforcement, as sometimes I think it's presented. Um, I think sometimes it gets conflated as anti-law enforcement or naive to the limitation of other approaches, but I think this these findings really show that it's more about just relieving that stringency and coming at conservation with um, a more multi-pronged set of approaches. Three, I think it demonstrates there's really a wide diversity in thinking as indicated in those five categories. It can't just be characterized as some moral polarity between conservation practitioners and critical social, social scientists as it's sometimes presented. I think this it's um, the polarization is kind of more over this critique itself and how you can effectively act upon it. And finally, I think that these critiques also offer some insight as to why they haven't been reflected in policy or they're not attractive to policymakers and practitioners. I think it's because there's issues with how well the critique holds up to reality and how difficult it may be to integrate it into policy, but also because there's some uneasiness with relying on social science. And so based on these findings, I developed five um, general recommendations for how to do conservation better that might be valuable, valuable to some conservation practitioners. I think first and most importantly, we really have to, so all these interventions have to more strongly conform to, to rights-based approaches and just a stronger adherence to human rights frameworks that are in place for conservation. Second, I think there needs to be um, a stronger commitment to an implementation of community level interventions for anti-poaching. And similarly, I think we need to strike a better balance between approaches where approaches are kind of adapted to the, the, the stressors of the context rather than just transplanting these models of anti-poaching. Um, and so forth, I think both kind of conservation organizations and NGOs, as well as the state agencies have to start providing a more balanced curriculum for wildlife rangers really just focusing on these nonviolent strategies like, like sensitization or community relations and um, just kind of holding regular community-wide meetings and consultation opportunities with communities. And lastly, I think they need to start relieving funding and divert it towards other strategies. And when, when donors and philanthropists wanna support this law enforcement when it's necessary, which is sometimes the case, I think they have to ensure that those who they are funding are organizations that have strong human rights records and abide by human rights frameworks.
And I think these, these findings also point to some areas where the critique really needs to be sharpened by these um, critical social scientists. And I have four broad recommendations for them. I think first for this critique to gain a little more potency, there has to be more nuanced ways of really defining this green militarization. As demonstrated in these findings, I think kind of blanket policies against militarization may not always be sensible. So I think we really have to develop stronger typologies to really identify and pin down where these kind of human rights abuses are happening or what's producing those negative outcomes. Um, second, I think research should focus on bringing in more voices to this conversation, um, ones that have really been absent from the literature, really like the rangers or different sectors of local communities like youth and women or practitioners and these military officers that are um, carrying out these militarized campaigns. Uh, third, I think we need to examine these community-led anti-poaching programs and community policing or intelligence gathering kind of programs. I don't know if they're a positive development or a concerning one, but I do think they merit a little more attention since they're gaining a lot of notoriety and popularity. And lastly, I think we really have to transition to building alternative models and really start testing them. We've Critiquing has kind of served its purpose. It's time to move beyond that. Um, so there are some limitations of the study. This includes um, time constraints and limited access to this, to a more representative sample of, especially really among the practitioners. Um, and since this was a qualitative study rather than a quantitative one of assessment of perspectives, it's not really a sufficient sample size to um, illuminate how many scholars or practitioners support a certain alternative or think a certain way. That was outside the purview of this thesis, but I think it may be useful in the future to kind of find out. Um, I also took a pretty broad scope, both geographically and the research question in general, so it, it can't offer any fine grained or specific alternatives for every context. It's more of a broad framework. And so I want to conclude just by highlighting what I think are the three major takeaways from this study. Um, so as the main argument of this thesis, there are alternatives and ideas of how to do conservation better, but as demonstrated in these findings, there's, there's also weaknesses to these critiques that fail to highlight why alternative approaches or um, these demilitarization ideas and policies may not be desirable for wildlife and people. We have to really start thinking more critically about how, how best to demilitarize and um, tease out what you really want to get from this critique. And I, but I also think that the findings shouldn't negate the need to develop alternatives. Even the most ardent defenders of green militarization agree this is not any kind of long-term solution. It's, it's a stop the bleeding kind of approach to, to buy time and uh, make the space for uh, better approaches in the future. So I think it's important to start developing these models now and not let this disagreement over um, militarization delegitimize or delay alternatives. And finally, I think this study should really serve as a start, starting point to stimulate um, a more engaging discussion with both the critical scholarship and practitioners about what um, alternative approaches can really help transition away from militarized approaches. I think by just up a better dialogue, conservation scholars and practitioners may be able to better devise ways to commit conservation a little more collaboratively um, to produce better outcomes for wildlife and people. And that's it. Thank you. Great job, Matt. Thank you. Matt, that was that was really terrific. Um, oh, so you. what we're going to do is um, we'll go ahead and collect batches, let's say batches of three at a time questions, and then um, we'll let you answer all of them, and then we'll go back to the pool. OK. So um, show of hands. <clears throat> I can see everybody, by the way. So oh. who would like to um, ask Matt a question? Sorry, that, that is um, Nicole. Or who else? I see Amanda's hand up. Who's Amanda? Amanda, put your hand up so I can see you. I can see her hand up. Maybe you okay. can't. I, 
That's funny. I can't see anything. And anybody else? Chris, I'm going to make you a co-host that, so that you can see it. Or maybe, actually, no. Um, I thought I was a co-host. I think that needs to make you a co-host so that you can see the hands raised. Can you... I thought I was, but that's fine. No, sorry. We, we switched out who was doing it, and uh, I just need to make you a co-host. <clears throat> Well, um, why don't we go ahead and start with Nicole's question. Okay, uh, great job, Matt. That was really interesting. Um, Thank you. I don't think you mentioned this, but if you did, I apologize. But um, in your recommendations, you said that um, they sh you should bring in more diverse voices into this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if in the interviews or your um, research um, in the literature, if you knew what more of those diverse voices thought, like if they talked about what the local people thought in any of those areas. Um, well, you Matt, know. Matt, what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect questions and you can answer them in batches, okay? Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> so um, keep that one in mind. I think the question was, um, do you have a sense of what people on the ground are saying, local communities? And then Amanda, um, would you like to answer a question? Ask a question rather? Yes. Uh, great job, Matt. That was a very um, interesting presentation. I was really excited to hear more about your work. So I thought it was very interesting you as a student working and researching social scientists and you said that some of your interviewees kind of dismissed the social science aspect of um, what some uh, academics were saying and you were saying that it was about like practitioners kind of being dismissive of that how how were you met by these interviewees coming from a perspective of like somebody who is an academic in the social sciences all right so let's go ahead and um <clears throat> matt why don't you address nicole and amanda's questions okay um so about the local community voices, some that was kind of actually pointed out to me that there's really been a lack of, you know, on the ground kind of studies. There's not really, no one's really gone in and asked, you know, what do you think about green militarization? It's kind of happened from the top. You know, it's been like the Western scholars saying this. There was someone, I, I think I put it in my, um, in one of my slides. One of them said that it has like these white savior undertones. And that's kind of like, you know, it's, there's no local discussion of all among these people about how they feel about these dynamics. And there was probably, if you did ask them what his point was that they probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't align with what they're finding in these critiques. They probably have different issues with the conservation rather than just the, the military character or their appearance of conservation. Um, I hope that answers what you're asking. And then let's see, what was that? And so how was I met among the, uh, the practitioners? Is that what you're asking, Amanda? I'm sorry. Yeah, because you mentioned that they were somewhat dismissive of the yeah. social so, science of it. Yeah, so there was four out of the six were kind of just in some ways, and sometimes it was a little more subtle. It was like one was saying, you know, we don't engage with emotionalized claims. We can't, there's nothing we can do about when someone says, or they, there's nothing we can do when they have these normative assumptions about green militarization. That's kind of what his point was. Then there was also two that were really uh, very dismissive of it. And, you know, it's, I kind of understand too, in some ways, because not, not dismissing social science, but they're also critiquing, you know, what these people are dedicating their lives to doing, protecting animals and stuff. And now you're saying, were embroiled in human rights abuses. So they're kind of dismissive in that regard, I guess. Um, but I, they were very kind and like about, um, you know, talking about that, but they were kind of trying to explain to me how social science can't really deliver actionable knowledge, I guess, for conservation. Thanks, Matt. Sure. Who else would like to answer a question, ask a question? You only have Matt for a few more minutes. So, you know, to take this opportunity to, to bask in his, his knowledge here. L Lucy, go ahead. 
mute. The Zoom mistake I make every single time that you think I would learn by. I'm always on mute. Um, so I do have a question. I know that things had changed and you ended up having to do these interviews via Zoom. And how do you think that that survey method affected your answers? And if you could redo it again, how would you approach it? Um, honestly, I think it made it a little better in some ways that my interviews, because they were, you know, this was happening right when the pandemic broke out. So they were giving me plenty of time to do this. Um, so I was talking, you know, sometimes for an hour with these first 10 interviewees. Then it made it a lot harder because, you know, things really picked up with the pandemic and nobody could do any, <laughs> anything. So, um, but if I were to do it again, I think I would actually do it more as a case study and see how different, I guess, sectors of a community see, perceive of green militarization or perceive of not going in with any assumptions about um, militarization, just going in and saying, what do you think about these conservation policies? What do you, policies, what do you think about these practices? What are your issues with it? Um, and I think that it probably wouldn't align with these critiques. So that's probably what I would do. Sure. Who else is out there? Okay, well, listen, um, I suppose we can move on to the next phase of things. Um, but I, does, while I have your attention, everybody, I'll go ahead and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer those questions too. <laughs> just for, for so this is something that I work on as well and I first of all what Matt's done here is um a really good job of presenting all these debates and I don't you know expect you to give up any of your your intelligence networks here but I was Adrian Garside one of the person people that you yeah. talked to yeah <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> so, okay he's a, he's a we're collaborators oh okay okay yeah 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 uh and yeah, he's he's not a big fan of the the scholars, yeah, but uh, <laughs> you know, what what you said was basically I could hear Adrian speaking. That's yeah. why I asked you. Yeah. So um, so that's true. Like all these, for some reason, there's not this successful cross pollination between scholars and practitioners, and that it's a bit of a puzzle for me because it seems like a natural fit that the practitioners would want scholars to come in to do research on what they're doing. But unfortunately, a lot of the scholars are working in, in this green militarization world, where they're kind of working backwards from normative assumptions, that militarization is bad. And not only that, but like the main driver of it all is neoliberalism, you know, and it's like this sort of catch all cause for absolutely everything. It's why we drink while we smoke, while we gamble, you know, it's, it, neoliberalism is the, so it doesn't really do any good granular um, causal assessments about what's driving these, um, these processes of militarization and their pernicious effects. And so there is, a, there's a need for like kind of a new wave of, of scholarship that comes in to the critique of the critiques, right? That says, okay, this is great. You know, you guys have given us a vocabulary, but you know, there's, there's, got to be other things going on here that can facilitate this dialogue between the practitioners and the scholars and for some reason the scholars are dismissive of, of the practitioners and i'm not sure why that is because they're the people in the, on the ground doing the work but i just i just want to address the local population question that um that nicole asked and matt was right that it's usually western scholars spending time on the ground in the communities that are in and around these parks, conducting interviews, getting this, a sense of how they see wildlife authorities, but um, then it's refracted through this lens of neoliberalism and um, neo, new neo-colonial racist tropes and whatever language that they use. But there's not a lot of effort by these governments to get some sort of buy-in for the local population about what their experiences is. Um, experiences are instead it's it's really kind of it relies on this community conservation model that matt was talking about where if you live in a district that neighbors a park you should get some of the revenue that goes into the park from from tourism and some countries are pretty successful at that and others aren't so successful at that so that's another angle um, of research that i think would be really interesting um, in the future you know it's sort of this, this comparative analysis of what works what doesn't so for example in rwanda 
the the communities around the parks there they actually get quite a lot <laughs> they get compared to other country uh, countries in uganda i think it's 20 percent of the gate fee they get but they have to apply for the money and they have to and there's probably some local level corruption that goes on and it's usually for distinct development projects but it's this idea that if you get the community to understand the importance of conservation because it's a revenue earner for the country that they will also assist in law enforcement right so they'll give up intelligence networks that poachers are using and they'll they'll help the, the park rangers identify these poachers in their communities so um, it, the, the militarization and the community conservation kind of goes like this. And that was actually uh, Matt's original idea for this, for this project was to look at this nexus. Um, so yeah, that was, that's, I just wanted to weigh in on those two questions just from what, what, I, what I've observed from the last couple of years of me doing this stuff. Um, does that raise anybody else's um, curiosity to ask more questions? If not, we'll go ahead and um, um, ask this nicely attended audience to, to say goodbye to Matt and then um, Matt will have to brace himself for his committee. And oh, Annette wants to ask a question. Yeah, I mean, sometimes if committee members want, they could also ask questions during the Q&A line. Um, I just wanted, Matt, you to address this whole, you know, I, the whole notion of the critique of social science. And my understanding is really that the green militarization literature is coming from a specific type of social science rather than all of social science. Oh. And some of what I fear a little bit in uh, your discussions, both in the paper and, and even in the presentation, is that you're putting this blanket critique of social science. But I think what you're talking more about is case study based and qualitative based, multi-method, qualitative types of social science research rather than maybe some of the quantitative survey driven social science research yeah. that might be out there. Is that more in line of what you're talking about in terms of yeah. the critique of social science? I think it's that, but it's also kind of, um, so a lot of these papers have come out as perspective pieces and commentaries and they're not using any kind of methods, you know, they're just kind of basing it off of not necessarily normative, but it's, it's, it is conjecture in some ways. I see what they're saying. Um, I think that's what they were really getting at is that there's no rigorous, there's few at least that have like any kind of interview methods and stuff like that. That's more of what I think I was trying to say, but I see what you're saying too. Yeah, I mean, I would add that there's, there's, there's the disciplinary divides between scholars that are doing this kind of research. So when I'm when I'm starting this research project, I'm one of the only political scientists doing it. It's mainly dominated by geographers, political ecologists, anthropologists, and political scientists from Europe, which are different than the ones that are trained here for some reason. Um, and so there's this uh, tendency to sort of front end the the like an advocacy agenda. And there ain't nothing wrong with that, right? There ain't nothing wrong with trying to make the world a better place if you're not doing this for that then why are you bothering at all but um they seem they tend to work backwards from a lot of that and that's not what social science is supposed to do social science is supposed to understand what is and then explore the implications of that for what ought to be and i think some of the well i mean that's what political science is i don't know maybe it's different for other disciplines so um i think to annette's point um it might be useful to um, just to identify that social science, there's, there's a lot of diversity within social science and they have, there's different methods and different agendas. Yeah, Matt, I, I might just add too that, um, you know, this seemed more like a, a critique of the ivory tower than actually social science, right? Um, because, you know, social science is really the cap or, or the cornerstone of, of most policy making. Um, so, you know, for them to critique social science might just really be a misunderstanding of, or, or maybe a conflation of rigorous policy making from an academic position with kind of the theorization of conservation, right? And I think in, in large part, the theorization uh, work that you've done so well in, in navigating 
probably doesn't resonate so well with people on the field that are actually dealing with some of these problems, right? So, so maybe that's kind of where the disconnect is coming. Okay. I, I had a question for Dr. Day and Matt and this one. As someone who's not focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm, I'm curious, is green militarization, in your opinion, something that's distinct to the subcontinent, or is it something that we should be thinking about more global? What, what would, uh, for, especially for students, is, is there a possibility that they should be thinking about this in other places as well, or is there something about your, your case and your choices that makes it unique? You want me to go first? Yeah. I think it's unique somewhat to Sub-Saharan Africa because you're it's happening in Southeast Asia. You know, there's the RED, REDD program where they're militarizing the forests and stuff like that, but you're protecting different resources. They're not mobile, they're, you know, they're, they're forests instead of animals and they're, I was, I don't, don't, they're not as lucrative to poach. So I think it's different in that regard. That would be off the top of my head, that's what I'm thinking, but yeah. So the, um, the literature that addresses this is actually widely comparative. So it, it just happens to be disproportionately focused on Africa because that's where all the big, big trophy animals are. And that's where the money is and ivory and rhino horns and stuff like that. But um, there's quite a lot of people that do research in, like Matt was saying, Southeast Asia and also Latin America. Um, but the, the nature of conservation just varies between countries. So like you could have forest reserves in one country and, you know, in these big, huge game national parks and others. But um, What's, I, so I, the short answer to your question that it's totally comparative. So if you were interested in, in looking at this in, in your area of the world, it's totally doable. It's just that the, the political context is different and the, the conservation context is just slightly different. Thank you. All right, folks. All right, well, Matt, let's move on to the next phase. All right. Good job, Matt. Thank you. Good job, Matt. You did good. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you.